Shabbat Shalom. Chag Sameach. Everybody loves this time of year because it is the time of year when all of the harvests were coming in and everyone's storehouse was full. The, uh, the counting of all of the, the beautiful things that were now going to be able to be eaten both this time as well as for the rest of the winter months was uh, making us all very happy. But of course, in the ancient world, if this was the time of greatest abundance, this was also the time of the greatest taxes. This was tax season, or at least it was one of the tax seasons. See, Judaism loves taxes. Uh, we, the word tax is probably not the, uh, the right word because the word tax has a, a particular connotation in modern English. And as I mentioned on Yom Kippur, words that are, some, that are not Hebrew sometimes have funny feelings to them that are not exactly Jewish feelings, but we'll use it for today. But I want to point out all the different ways that Judaism tried to take your money and give it to someone else which is basically what most people are worried about. So, let's see how good you remember all of the taxes that are found in Judaism. Oh boy, all right, so give me an example of a Jewish uh, taking of your money to give to someone else. All right, Sadaka, right? So Sadaka, generally speaking, wasn't taken from you. That was something that you were encouraged to do. Now, I will point out that the community could, uh, in addition to all the other forms of official uh, taking of property to, to redistribute, the community could, if it felt you did need to give more in order to support an orphan or a widow or somebody that was in need or in order to contribute to the building of the walls around the city or in order to contribute to uh, the other general welfare of the community, the building of wells and waterworks, they could lean on you to, to pay up. So Sadaka was usually not compulsory, except when you were kind of sort of compelled. Uh, not quite the same official compulsion as other forms, but they definitely knew how to twist arms when necessary to get what was needed from different members of the community to provide for the community and its members. So, Sadaka will sort of put in a, a side box. The half shekel. So I've got the half shekel and I have the maser, right, which is also referred to as tithing. Let's deal with the simple one first, the, the half shekel. Uh, round about springtime, or we get an announcement uh, during the season leading up to Purim, we are told that everybody has to give a half shekel to the temple service. So tabernacle first, but temple later. And that was a half shekel whether you are rich, a half shekel whether you are poor, and this half shekel would be what was used for the money, excuse me, that was necessary for buying the sacrifices that would go on the altar that were part of the daily offerings on behalf of the entire nation. You can begin to piece together why it was so important that the Torah wanted us to have everybody give the same amount for this particular form of taxation. Any interpretations that spring to mind? Nobody's above anybody else in front of God. Right? Very specifically that on the altar, we needed to all feel that we had contributed an equal amount to that particular animal that was being slaughtered on behalf of all of us. Right? It wasn't, I donated one toe and he donated the whole back half because he was so rich and I was so poor. No. I donated one toe, he donated one toe, she donated one toe. It was one, 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 or half, half, half for everybody equally. That whole cow belongs to all of us equally. Therefore, we are all before God and fulfilling this duty equally. However, tithing, well, what does tithing literally mean? One tenth, right? It was a very simple calculation. All you had to do, it's actually more complicated than you might think, is add up your gross agricultural product, because that was the main way that people made wealth in, our, in antiquity, and one-tenth of it would no longer belong to you. Who did it belong to? 
the priests the, 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 and the Levites, the poor, the state. Okay, so it was complicated, right? In fact, it depended on what year you were in during the sabbatical cycle. On the third and sixth year of the sabbatical cycle, the one-tenth that you were taking would be given to the poor, whether it be the stranger, whether it be the widow, the orphan, or anyone else that was in desperate financial needs, that what you had would be given to them. This is mentioned explicitly in the Torah portion that we read tomorrow. In the other years of the sabbatical, the uh, one, two, four, five, and seventh year, it was given to the Levites and Kohanim. It was given to the, the priestly class, if you will, because they, like the poor, didn't have anything with which to make their own food. Right? Remember the Levites and the Kohanim, which were a subpart of the Levite clan, they were not given any of the land of Israel. Therefore, what were they supposed to be growing their food with? And if they had nothing to grow with, then they needed support in order to make sure that there would be enough for them. But I can hear your brilliant Jewish minds, the gears spinning as you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How come five-sevenths of my tithe, meaning out of the seven years, is going to the Kohanim and Leviim, and only two-sevenths is going to the poor? What do the poor do for the other five years that I'm not giving them a tenth to help them? Ah, uh, we have the peyot and we have the leket, right? So the peyot is the teaching that the Torah tells us that when we are harvesting our fields, the corners of the fields must be left for the poor. What's that? So yes and no. So the law is technically only in, uh, applicable in Israel and only under certain conditions. However, people do, who are farmers that, are, that care about these things, and Jewish farmers, do still find a way to make the corners of their field work for those that don't have enough. Now, in the ancient world, this meant that literally, people who were poor would walk into your field, they would go to the corners, they'd take out their knife, and they'd cut down the stalks, they'd take that, they'd grind it, and they'd make their flour. That was what they would do to eat. So too, the forgotten sheaves, if you were gathering your sheaves and you left some behind, you were commanded not to go back and get it, but instead leave it there for the poor to come behind you and for them to gather for themselves. So this made sure that every year there would always be at harvest time something that was available for the poor to take care of them. And what about the Kohanim? On years three and six, are they going to starve to death? Truma. What's that? Well, they have the sacrifices if it is their time for working at the temple. Not every Kohen was working at the temple every week. They had a rota where different families of the Kohanim, different clans would be there. And even then, not necessarily everybody would be at the altar working um, because there simply wasn't enough business, if you will, for, for everyone to be eating from the altar all the time. But all the time, a Kohen was allowed and, and expected to receive something called truma. Truma were gifts that were given by the nation, by the individuals, to your local Kohen, right? You know, Mr. Cohen down the street or Mr. Khan in the front row, hey, you know what? We had a, a, a lovely harvest this year. Let's give him some of that. And it was a voluntary gift. There wasn't a particular minimum measure. Um, around 1 50th was sort of natural for people to try to give away. And then on top of that, every time you go to make bread, you had to pull off a piece of the dough that you were baking. This is what is known as challah. Right? Challah doesn't mean bread. Lechem means bread. Challah is the part that is removed from the dough that would then be given to the Kohen. So every time you went to feed yourself, you also had to think about the Kohen who didn't have anything to feed himself with or feed his family with, and you would take a portion and give it for them. So that way, they too could be able to continue to eat. It is a remarkable uh, act of mindfulness that even as you are preparing for yourself and your family, you are thinking about someone else who does not have the means to provide for his own family. 
because he is involved in doing the other work that is necessary. And even if he's not at the temple, it is still his due. And this is ultimately what we see from this vastly more complex system of Jewish taxation than we've just discovered. This is like literally scratching the surface of how complicated it can be. But throughout all of this, what you've noticed is that it is complicated because the needs of a community are complicated. The needs of the individual are complicated. How we balance what we contribute to the temple versus what we contribute to with the Kohanim versus what we contribute to those who are poor in this year or that year, whether you are a farmer or whether you are not, all of this was meant to make us mindful of the blessings that we have received and to recognize that in them we have a responsibility to support our community and to support everybody in the community from the most highest members to those that are suffering the most as well. So does that mean that no Jewish person ever complained about taxes and tithing and all of the other issues? Of course they did. There are people who have been stingy the entirety of history, and there will probably continue to be stingy people until Mashiach comes. But the vast majority of our tradition has never looked askance at the issue of taxation, and instead seen in it a system of justice that allows the entire community to be able to help one another and support the institutions that are so valuable to the, the fullness of Jewish life, as well as support all the members in the fullness of the Jewish world. And this has ensured that we have always looked to one another to see who was in need and to see whom we could help. And thus, like I said, you don't see a lot of Jews worried about taxation, but instead worried more about, are we doing enough? And as long as we are continued to be moved by that spirit, then I'm sure that we will be able to do enough. Shabbat Shalom and Chag Sameach.